Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our viewers, speakers, and chairs in different parts of the world. We are back again with very two interesting lectures for you. The speaker for the first session of today is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Yuichi Murayama. Professor Murayama is the chief, the chairman of Department of Neurosurgery at the JK University School of Medicine, Tokyo, Japan. He is also the director at the Stroke Center at the JK University School of Medicine. He is a very integral part of Japanese Japanese Society of Neuroendovascular Therapy and Cerebrovascular Disease and Therapy Committee of the WFNS. He is an noted author of several publications and he also serves on the editorial board of several important journals like journal of neuroendovascular therapy neurology and medico chirurgica and nosinkegeka he has won several awards for his scholarly work in interventional red- neuroradiology and we are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and today he'll be talking about hybrid operation theater current status at the jk university school of medicine the speaker for the second session of today is an honored guest from the dominican republic of cgian carlo hernandez professor hernandez is a director of the endoscopic surgery unit skull basin center of pituitary surgery at the cesanot cardio neuro ophthalmology and Trans- transplant center dominican republic He also delivers his service at the Dominican Gamma Knife Center where he performs radio surgery for various disorders. He was the past president of the Dominican Society of Neurology and Neurosurgery as well as the Caribbean Association of Neurological Surgeons. He is an invited faculty to various workshops and conferences organized worldwide by several neurosurgical societies. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker and today he'll be talking about multimodality treatment of pituitary adenomas. The chair for the session of Professor Hernandez will be Professor Kenichi Oyama. from Japan Professor Oyama is director and professor at the Department of Neurosurgery International University of Health and Welfare Mita Hospital Tokyo his interest includes neurotrauma and skull based pituitary surgery and spine surgery he is also interested in the methodology of clinical neurosurgical research particularly trials and global neurosurgery he was a previous clinical fellow at the Pittsburgh and Paris he has won several awards and honors during his vast illustrious career and he is a noted author with several publications in various international peer reviewed journals we are extremely thankful to him for accepting an invitation to chair the second session of the webinar today on behalf of the education committee of the acns and the president of the yoko kato i would like to welcome both the speakers chairs and all the audiences to this online platform of acns webinars dr lubun singh from malaysia is my co-host for today and i would like to special thank professor shubin for airing this webinar on the wechat channel and as well as professor shubin's colleagues in shanghai welcome to you all and with that introduction i would like to request professor murayama to start his lecture thanks for kind invitation and uh, i'm i'm happy to present uh, our system uh, and share with you so uh, my name is yuichi murayama chairman of um, uh, neurosurgery at gk university hospital so let me introduce uh, our hospital uh, this is a map of tokyo As you can see, uh, this is a palace. Uh, this is a center of Tokyo. Uh, our hospital is uh, located just south of the uh, palace. And uh, uh, you can see Tokyo Tower here. And uh, we uh, built a new outpatient uh, building uh, last year. uh just before covid-19 so we have uh, three hybrid or system and <clears throat> we are very active for neuro endovascular treatment spine surgery and uh brain tumor scar based uh, program so uh let me explain our system uh, hybrid or system uh <clears throat> we uh start this system in 2003 uh, we first uh, presented our system at, in uh general neurosurgery using a uh, biplain biplain uh, dss system subsequently uh, then uh, we installed robotic dss system uh, so called uh, zigo in 2005 6 and then now we replace uh robotic dsa from uh, zigo to feno system <clears throat> so we have two feno system in the or and one biplan system uh <clears throat> so we are running th- three uh hybrid ors for neurosurgery and <clears throat> in the room 
5 and 21, we install robotic system and we have two different type of uh, surgical bed. <clears throat> In room five, we use conventional endovascular uh, <clears throat> uh, table. And in room 21, we have um, <clears throat> surgical bed. So we, we use three rooms. So this is a, a brief summary of the, the percentage of uh, the procedures in the hybrid doors. Uh, approximately 40% of our procedures are endovascular treatment, 20% spine, almost 20% brain tumors and 22% of others. <clears throat> How it works? Um, as you know, DSS system is angio machine, but recent technology of uh, <clears throat> CM CT system, so-called cone beam CT <clears throat> uh, provide uh, CT-like images <clears throat> uh, during our procedures. We utilize this uh, cone beam CT and then send those images to the uh, navigation system. So let me explain three procedures, neurovascular surgery, brain tumor surgery, and spine surgery. <clears throat> CMC provide uh, fluoroscopy, angiography, and CMCT. Uh, this is the, the example of a uh, flow diverter placement. Uh, for example, we use two flow diverters for giant anism. We can simulate this kind of stent procedures. <clears throat> so regular uh, endovascular procedure, it's, it, it's, uh, it, you can perform in uh, regular angio suite. However, the case like this, the patient has very tortuous uh, <clears throat> access route. In those case, we uh, <clears throat> directly open carotid and we perform uh, direct puncture approach. So uh, we insert, insert uh, guiding catheter into the uh, <clears throat> carotid artery. And then uh, we can uh, perform flow diverter placement without difficulty. So far we performed uh, more than 15 uh, <clears throat> direct carotid approach in the complex <clears throat> anism. This is the example of a dural AV fistula case. <clears throat> so, uh, so far we treated 174 uh, dural AV fistula of these we performed 15 cases for combined approaches. And this is a left frontal complex cortical AV fistulas. And in those cases, it's quite difficult to advance uh, catheters into the small feeding arteries. So we perform a direct approach and ICZ. <clears throat> After uh, craniotomy, um, we place the uh, microcatheter into the uh, feeding artery. And then <clears throat> we inject uh, onyx system like this. From femoral, we perform angios and we confirm the uh, fistula point. And then uh, we perform <clears throat> uh, combined approach and occlude the uh, fistula point. This is the example of uh, unruptured large left ICA anism. And the patient uh, was uh, 66 years old female and she uh, suffered left uh, 
Sadna Parsi and uh, Fifth Nerve Spain. So uh, instead of uh, just uh, endovascular packing, we decided um, emergency um, uh, ECIC anastomosis followed by the parent artery occlusion. So we confirmed the um, anastomosis between ICA and ECA. And we also confirmed the, <clears throat> the flow from posterior circulation. And then uh, we perform CMCT uh, and so-called, <clears throat> this is a special technique, so-called uh, perfusion DynaCT. So this DynaCT can be used like a, a SPECT uh, to uh, confirm um, brain saturation. So based on this uh, perfusion DynaCT, there was no uh, laterality during occlusion test. So we decide bypass and we perform uh, interop uh, 3D <clears throat> image show the uh, successful bypass surgery. And then we perform parent artery occlusion. So we published this comparative study between DynaCT and SPECT. <clears throat> So the, the result is uh, almost identical between uh, SPECT and CMCT-based uh, perfusion DynaCT. This is the example, example of uh, thrombosed large uh, right vertebral artery anism. <clears throat> so, as you can see, the brainstem was uh, compressed by the uh, thrombosed aneurysms. <clears throat> Our colleague, uh, Dr. Watanabe, performed a beautiful surgical approach for this VA uh, complex aneurysm. So he performed the uh, anterior, pe petro anterior uh, petro approach combined with uh, lateral suboccipital retrosigmoid approaches. So this is surgery. After dissection, uh, he conducted surgery uh, carefully and <clears throat> uh, temporary clip was placed and then <clears throat> proximal and distal VA was trapped. Then he performed the uh, <clears throat> uh, surgical exposure of the uh, thrombos giant anism. And then uh, we removed the thrombos <clears throat> thrombus from the aneurysm sac. And <clears throat> aneurysm wall was carefully <clears throat> sutured. So immediately after surgery, we confirmed by intro of Andrew So surgery was nicely done and brain compression was improved. As this is interop angio. The other case from both left P1, P2 dissecting anism, we uh, performed combined stent assist of coiling and <coughs> occipital artery and PCA bypass. So you can see thrombose uh, uh, weird uh, 
left P1 thrombosis anism. <clears throat> the first, uh, my colleague performed OA pica bypass. Then the anism coiling and the stent was placed. And this is the final uh, images of um, bypass was patent and anism is completely obliterated. I also uh, like to introduce uh, our new technology, so-called cone beam uh, 3D IVDSA. <clears throat> and as you know, the intra-op DSA is usually performed trans-arterial approaches, but using our hybrid OR system, we establish IV DSA injection, <clears throat> and I'll show you the example. Uh, this is one of the example of distal ACA anism. So upper two is, <clears throat> uh, left side is <clears throat> conventional uh, 3D DSA, and right CD is IV DSA. Of course, uh, IADC, the DSA image is very, very sharp, but <clears throat> IVDSA also shows uh, excellent imaging. So this is example of Moya Moya bypass. And <clears throat> uh, this image is, is um, uh, IVDSA. And because uh, although uh, ICZ is excellent, but sometimes I see ICZ technology is not effective for deep seated <coughs> vessel evaluation. In those case, IVDSA uh, is uh, another alternative to confirm the patency of the vessel. And this is post op MRA, confirm uh, nice. <clears throat> bypass surgery. I also want to introduce uh, our <clears throat> uh, technology uh, under COVID-19 situation. <clears throat> uh, we established a remote and vascular education system. <clears throat> so you can see uh, on your left there is a, a junior resident <clears throat> working in the um, affiliate hospital. And on the right, uh, this is main hospital, university hospital. So I help uh, junior resident uh, endovascular procedure using remote system. <clears throat> and now I'm pro uh, performing the procedure in the main university hospital and the young resident is uh, observing the procedures in the remote area, remote hospital. So using iPad, uh, the junior resident can observe uh, like like almost same uh, operating room. So the, I'm using the uh, bone transmitted uh, head system, so I can communicate with the audience and I can communicate with our colleagues during the procedures. So junior resident can uh, learn and the procedures even uh, is not uh, <coughs> located uh, in the same uh, hospital. Mm. 
for endovascular procedures, uh, this kind of uh, remote uh, education system is well fit under the uh, COVID-19 situation. So now my junior resident is performing the procedures at the Affiliate Hospital. So he's planning. <笑>いや、まあ、でも、今いい人いるかな。これ、これ。まあ、あの、ステント展開して当然、あの、コイル入れて抜けてくるのが心配だからね。ああ。ちょっと、ちょっと、ここ so uh, this is the US Japan uh, because of uh, new endovascular uh, for diverters system. Okay. So between Japan, Tokyo, and uh, Boston, we can communicate, and uh, uh, proctors uh, can watch the procedures uh, real time. There's some gap. Yeah. At the uh, outside, right here from bone transmitting um, headset for his advice. So, second, uh, I uh, present the brain tumor surgery. So uh, this is a recurrent uh, 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 glioma patient. So uh, <clears throat> we can confirm the, uh, the tumor uh, area by MRI and fuse, fusion of the intradynacity. And during introp um, <clears throat> images, we resect the tumors. And on your left, you can see introp dynasty. And on your right, right, this is a post of MRI. Of course, imaging quality is inferior to MRI system, but <clears throat> uh, we, we can solve the problem of brain shift. So, uh, Using the uh, contrast injection, we can confirm the residual uh, tumors like this. So the CONBM, CMCT, and MR's uh, volume uh, comparison is almost identical. It's two um, pituitary adenoma. So you can see the uh, <coughs> Uh, large um, pituitary tumors. Our ENT team approached the nose part. And then uh, during, uh, after tumor resection, we bring CMCT and obtain CT images. Then those intraop CT image uh, will be sent to the uh, brain lab navigation 
So this is uh, intraop dynasty, and this is a post op MRI. So we can we can confirm the residual tumors using uh, dynasty system. Case three, three uh, hemangioblastoma case. <clears throat> So this patient was a pregnant 34 year old female. And uh, so the baby is in, in her uh, abdomen and she got the um, bleeding and <clears throat> compression of the brain stem. So we conducted uh, <clears throat> angiography and then we perform embryization then we performed uh, tumor resection. And this is post-op images. <clears throat> then I'd like to show you um, the spine procedures. Uh, this is basilar investigation in, in vagination patient, 16 years old. <clears throat> As you can see, the C1 and the occipital bone is fused. So she got uh, Kripper Pale uh, syndrome. <clears throat> so our spine team performed the, uh, the uh, fixation and using needle guidance software, we can perform the uh, <clears throat> intra of uh, CT. And then using those images, we perform <clears throat> screw placement. So you can see CT images here. And this is post of CM CT. So uh, the compression was successfully uh, conducted. Another case, uh, lumbar fracture patient. So this is a uh, <coughs> CMCT. Then using the uh, needle guidance software, uh, we conducted uh, placement of the screw. So this is the image of a uh, needle guidance. The operator can manipulate the uh, DSA system for uh, <coughs> optimal uh, angle for screw placement. So this is post-operative uh, CM3D images. So in our study, the, uh, we can uh, achieve uh, successful uh, <clears throat> safe uh, screw placement. However, there is some limitation of uh, current uh, CM system because originally the <clears throat> Uh, DSA is not designed for the uh, operative procedures. The, uh, <clears throat> the opening space of CM is not uh, <clears throat> large enough. So sometimes uh, uh, the uh, rotation of the system is not so easy. And <clears throat> the current system uh, improved the uh, opening space. So using a uh, new uh, generation so-called FENO system, we have more uh, working space in the uh, CM system. And CM system uh, is not real CT. Uh, it's a flat panel uh, rotation system. So the, the um, <coughs> The company is uh, spent a lot of effort to improve the images, <clears throat> and uh, in the, the 
Zigo, the old uh, robotic DSA system, you can see the artifact of the uh, head crown pin. But now, uh, Feno system, we have <coughs> several uh, softwares to uh, reduce artifact. And OR table itself has some limitation. The most of uh, uh, situation we use the carbon flat table, but it's not so flexible. And <clears throat> in room 21, we installed Mackey uh, multipurpose OR tables. But the limitation of this multipurpose table is uh, move, movement. It's not so quick, quickly move for endovascular procedures. And Mackey uh, flat table has uh, some limitation of the uh, direction of the head cramp placement. <clears throat> Mackey uh, flexible table has more room, but uh, uh, <clears throat> That system also some limitation for head uh, security. <clears throat> and this is the uh, variety of a head cramp system, base unit, adapters, and tables. So we have to choose uh, the system for spines, brain tumors, or vascular surgery. And we are still uh, learning what the uh, optimal uh, setup system for uh, specific treatment. <clears throat> Field of view is also some limitation. Regular CT has uh, large space uh, for <clears throat> imaging, but Siemens Feno Dyna CT is a relatively limited <clears throat> Uh, image view, field of view. So we also need some improvement in the future. In conclusion, DSA-based hybrid OR can be used not only for vascular disease, but also brain tumors or spine procedures. Cutting edge beam CT in combination with real-time navigation system allows safe and accurate neurosurgical procedures. Cost may be issue, but can be used without other specialties such as cardiovascular or orthopedics. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Professor. It was indeed a very wonderful presentation and we are really in awe of the technological developments in Japan. Uh, we'll take a few questions, if you don't mind, Sai. Hi, hi, thank you, Professor, for your great presentation. Yeah, I have no question, very good. No, thank you very much. There is a question on the chat box, which has popped up, which uh, who asked, CM CT, can, can it replace intraop CT or MRI? Well, um... Regarding the uh, spine, the, the bone image of front panel uh, on BMCT is excellent. The uh, challenging is uh, soft tissue, like a brain. So the company spent a lot of effort, but still uh, inferior to regular uh, 16 slides. So it's almost, but still some limitation. Of course, uh, the detail of the tissue uh, uh, is not well identified compared to MRI. So that's a limitation. However, <coughs> uh, uh, interop system has a uh, advantage, especially the, the interoperative position, you know, <coughs> and <coughs> Uh, interop uh, CT like an O-arm, uh, you can bring the system. Uh, you have to purchase the system separately. 
So it depends on the uh, uh, hospital cost. Uh, one hybrid room can be used for neurosurgery, uh, cardiovascular surgery, and also surgery. So uh, it's also related to the uh, cost of um, the uh, machines. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I think if there are no more questions, I would like to sincerely thank Professor Yuji Murayama for bringing a state-of-the-art technology of this hybrid operation theater at the JK University. Thank you very much, Professor Murayama. We can now move on to the second session. For the second session, I'd like to invite our chair, Professor Kenichi Oyama, to say a brief introduction and invite Professor Giancarlo Hernandez. Professor Oyama, all yours. Good evening, everybody. I'm Kenichi Oyama from International University of Health and Wellham Mita Hospital in Tokyo. It's my great honor to chair the uh, special lecture tonight. So I'd like to introduce to uh, today's speaker, Professor Giancarlo Hernando Leon. Uh, he's going to talk about the multimodality treatment of a pituitary tumor. So, Professor Giancarlo Fernando Leon, please start your lecture. First of all, I want to thank all the executive committee of the, of the Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons. For me, it's a privilege and an honor to, to participate in this um, in this uh, webinar. Well, my topic it will be the multidisciplinary treatment of pituitary adenomas. <clears throat> and as an overview, we know that we have an incidence of 10 to 20% of all intracranial tumors. And the non-functioning pituitary adenomas are between the 15 or 30% of all pituitary tumors uh, with 10% of incidentalomas uh, and 20 24 to 80% of all operate patients will have a tumor rest or recurrence. And of those, 67% will have, we will have a long-term growth. Uh, even in patients, even in patients with total resections, uh, we will see a 10 or 20% of recurrences. The aggressiveness aggressive, aggressive rates uh, is linked to uh, abnormalities in molecular patterns of these tumors. This subject is in continued in continue research. Uh, it's a tumor for the uh, young adult uh, and for both genders. The world brain radiotherapy, uh, has, we know, has a risk, high risk of complication like optic neuropathy, cognitive disorders, a high rate of hypopituitarism, stroke, uh, uh, and even radio-induced neoplasia and radio surgery has become an important neurosurgical tool to treat and the recurrence of the tumors in the pituitary region. Well, the, this classification is, is for all well known, is uh, about the size and about or based in his functionality in hormone levels of immune, immune histochemic chemistry and can be non-functional or functional and, and for functionals, uh, the hormone will dictate the disease, acromegaly, Cushing disease, or prolactinomas. But the important thing is this patient has to be treated in a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary pattern, multidisciplinary management. And there are three more important things in this multidisciplinary management is the medical treatment uh, for the endocrinologist, that will treat these patients with prolactinomas as the first line of treatment with bromocryptine, carbergoline, or will treat patients with, uh, with uh, acromegaly, uh, with um, medication like octroctype, visomant, uh, or ketoconazole for the ACTH producing uh, tumors. But <clears throat> all of these tumors, all of these tumors less than the prolactinoma, of course, we will have a surgical treatment that can be do by a craniotomy, but can be do by a microsurgical transphenoidal approach, or now has a paradigm, now the pure endoscopic endonational approach. And for those patients that will need a adjuvant treatment, I prefer the platform Gamma Knife uh, as, a, as a resource of uh, radiation therapy. Um, and we said, why endoscopic way? 
uh, there are a lot of um, benefits that, for the endoscopy. Like you necessarily see mucus tunnel when you, we perform the microsurgical approach. Uh, this one white exposure of the, the splenoid sinus is very important because when we <clears throat> see and we take off the rostrum of the esphenoid, we can identify all the anatomical landmarks that we need to identify in the roof of the esphenoid sinus, like the, the, all the septums in the esphenoid sinus that someone goes directly to the carotid artery, the carotid eminence of both sides around the cella turcica, the cleaver recess behind and the paraclival carotid artery in both eyes. And in the anterior part, we'll see the planum esphenoidale, the tuberculum sena, both optic nerves. And between the optic nerve and the eminence of the carotid, we will see these two um, landmarks that are very important, that are the occipital, the, the, the OCRs, or, or optical carotid recess, lateral optical carotid recess. But in the middle, <clears throat> between the optic and the carotid, that we have this the medial carotid recess that is important uh, take off in tumors that invade uh, the supracellular region. Uh, it is important to take off. We have another benefit that is a less for interventions, less fascial trauma, less postoperative, uh, more postoperative comfort, a few nasoceptal and dental complications, if less days of hospitalization. Some, some say that less cost, uh, there are a cost reduction, but the most important thing is that we will have a wilder, fee, a wi a wilder field of view uh, with a more illuminated uh, field of view that take us to a better neurovascular and anatomic control for, and a broader tumor resection. That is important because after, after you work uh, through these uh, landmarks, we will, we will see a uh, very important uh, elements, anatomical element that you have to spare, like carotid artery, for example, in the cavernous sinus, in the paraclival, in the paraclival, uh, paraclival carotid, and here, the optic nerve and the chiasma. And you have to pay attention also with this, that is the coronoid uh, sinus. And that this will be the panoramic uh, view that we will have with, when you change from the, from the microsurgical transesphenoidal approach that we see, you, we, you see the, object, the surgical objective in, at the bottom of the tunnel uh, uh, or when you put the endoscope at the final of the tunnel and you see this uh, beautiful panoramic view. And those are the benefits of the endoscope. So <clears throat> we have this instrumentation, a uh, full, uh, full uh, high definition camera. Uh, we, have, uh, we, we, we use the neurobat navigation. In the beginning, we use it in all cases. Now we use in cases that we know that we will need it. We have the <clears throat> endoscopic tower, and we use a rigid endoscope of four millimeters, 80, 80 centimeters long, or, and uh, zero and 30 degrees, and not, not always, but sometimes the 45 degrees. Uh, I'm a, I promote the teamwork with the ENT. It's important the teamwork with the ENT because we can do your part as a neurosurgeon, the pituitary intracranial exposure, identify anatomical landmarks, and you can perform the two-handed technique microsurgical. It's a microsurgical uh, movements, but not through a microscope, through a monitor. The ENT will be preserved the anatomy of the, of the nose. And when we, when we, when we work together, we obtain better results in the settings, in the instrument handling, maintaining uh, the, the calm in the time of crisis, and that increase the efficiency and the second opinions. 
the technique is binary in a two-hand microsurgical technique. Microsurgical because you do the same movements uh, that you do when you operate on a on microscope. That will give you more space for instruments, better visualization and different angles of instrumentation and visualization. As you see here, you put the endoscope at 12 o'clock in the right nostril and a, a suction in the six o'clock in the right nostril. And you can use the left nostril for you for, for put another instrument to work. And how big has to be the sphenodotomy? Well, it has to be big enough from anterior part to see all the planum and tuberculum celli. That is important to provide room from the endoscope uh, and lateral enough to see both OCRs, as I mentioned it before, mm, and have all the, all the structures that you have to be careful with. And that is important because it's published that when you failed in, in expose all the, these anatomical landmarks, you will have failure in, in perform a gross total resection and you will have a re repeat a, the surgery for residuals uh, tumors. The techniques in tumor resection is better to do it in by piecemeal sequel, sequential resection for big tumors and the pseudocapsular resection for, for uh, tumors that are no so big or microadenomas. This is important because you can, um, you can achieve that, but sometimes you can't achieve the, the pseudocapsular resection uh, like this. Uh, when you do the piecemeal, the piecemeal sequencing, uh, we have a sequence that has to be always the same. When you start with the below and posterior part of the tumor, then you go with the, even with this movement, like a U, you go first with, with one uh, carotid uh, cavernous sinus, then with the other cavernous sinus at, at at, at the final of the surgery, you attack the superior and supracellar part of the of the of the tumor. When you're looking for for the pseudo capsule, you have to be careful that when the tumor is is is, is, a, is a little tumor, you will have a, a gland that is is is, uh, is is not sick. It's a is a is is a normal gland. So you, you have to, to look and, and search this kind of uh, decolor or, you, or, or the tumor and then looking for this capsule and take off the tumor. This is an example that I said, it's a, it's a big tumor in the middle, but it's a big tumor. And here I cut always the Dura mother almost always uh, in the posterior fashion. Uh, first of all, as you see, then I attack the inferior and posterior part of the tumor. We do that kind of movements and then we finish with the, post the superior part. And then you see the, the normal gland and all the tumor um, out. And this is the post-operative um, post uh, result with a gross total resection uh, of the tumor. This is another, another, um, another case with a, a male 27 years old with a chromegaly. Uh, have you see, you have the tumor and you have the gland over the left um, cavernous sinus. And then here you have uh, the opening of the cella. The opening of the cella has to be big enough to, to reach all, um, all the tumor. Blue to blue to blue to blue, has uh, said the Americans. And here I open in cross. 
but as you see, you can use this kind of technique, the two, the two suckers technique, one hold the tissue, the other one suck the tissue. Uh, it's very useful. And, and sometimes that, that is useful in acromegaly that has some fibrous tumor uh, frequently. This is the gland over the left side of the, of the, of the cavernous sinus. This is another uh, acromegaly. This acromegaly um, was uh, operated twice by craniotomy from another, another colleague. It has uh, problems in the heart and has a, a growth hormone in 131. And this is the best way to treat an acromegaly uh, when you can take off all the tumor. Uh, as I said before, we attack first the posterior and inferior part of the tumor. Then we go lateral and, and then we go up. When you operate um, functional tumor, you, you, you need to try to take off all the capsule and be, and, and try to, to do an extra capsular um, resection. Sometimes you can reach that, achieve that. Sometimes you can't. That is important. You have to try at least, uh, but sometimes you can do that and, some can, and sometimes you can't. This is the result and now has an absolute, absolute metabolic improvement, normal levels of blood pressure, improving in her myocardial function and I have a, a, a growth hormone less than two. So it's control, it's a disease that is control. This is that I was uh, uh, tell you before, as you see, when you operate a microadenoma like this in a Cushing patient with obesity and Cushing good appearance, hypertension and high, high blood levels of cortisol, ACTH and cortisol in urine. When you open the dura, you will have, you will have a, a, a normal gland. So you have to pay attention when you open the dura in a, in a microadenoma. And you have to look for changes over the surface uh, to choose the site where you're going to open the gland. And then I found something there. Uh, and there you have the plane and there you have the tumor. We will take off the tumor. We will take off the tumor. Dussumon has the French set. And then I will I will I will I will search the I'm sorry. Well I will look for the capsule because that could be the difference in uh, uh, relapse in one year or two years or the cure of the patient. Uh, there's, there's come in the capsule and then we, we are done there. And we have this resection, total resection total resection and post-operative post cure of hypertension, noticeable weight reduction and chemical normal values in her cortisol and ACTH. And he has almost six years of relapse. So we are fine with that. Is there a role for the craniotomy in pituitary adenomas? Uh, well, of course there is. Uh, we have a lot of um, uh, school based uh, literature, books, outstanding books, uh, 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 publications about that. If, if you can do 
the approach in a minimally basic fashion is much better, but sometimes we need a classic craniotomy, even uh, extradural clinoidectomy in open the, the, the superior orbital fissure in patient that has cavernous sinus invasion and cavernous sinus invasion, more a uh, middle fossa invasion, of course. But if you can stay in a minimally invasive fashion is, is better uh, with this approach, that's a very versatile approach, the supraorbital eyebrow approach, uh, because you can, you can dominate all spots in the anterior cranial fossa, paracellar region, and ventral brainstem in the side of the, in the side choose by you as a surgeon to, to operate. And we have an example here. For example, this seven, seven years old, uh, uh, old man with progressive visual impairment. And he has this, uh, this uh, pituitary tumor that has some bizarre shape uh, with, uh, with a growth uh, toward the interpeduncular, uh, uh, interpeduncular space here with a compression of the of the posterior part of the of the posterior part of the uh, optic apparatus that's mean that if we choose a transfrontal approach and we take off these maybe maybe the the optic apparatus remains compressed here so we 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 choose to do a uh, 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 supraorbital eyebrow approach. You have to do the old step by step, the bony posture, the open the dura, and you see here the optic nerve, the carotid artery, and the tumor, and all the tumor, all the tumor off uh, below and, and, and right. And you have this uh, video, and I, that you have here. You have here the tumor and the optic nerve and the carotid artery, and you, you maybe you can use the retractorless, the retractorless technique. Sometimes you can do the retractorless technique. Sometimes you can't do the retractorless technique, and you have to use retractors. That is simple like that. Uh, but in this case, we can use the technique. And here are the tumor. And the tumor was very firm, very fibrous. So it was a good choice to come in from, from the head because as you've seen, I have to cut it with scissors. And well, and this is the result with visual recovery at integrum. Uh, this is a little hematoma here. Uh, as you see the brain in perfect status and the, the tumor off. And the aesthetic result in, in the face in the, is very, 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 very good. <clears throat> now, uh, how we use the gamma knife radiosurgery in pituitary adenomas? Uh, if there, if there is a, 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 a huge role um, from pituitary adenomas because it's a complementary treatment to surgery for residual tumors and recurrences sometimes that we can reoperate, uh, works against the persistence of secretory state in functional tumors. Uh, the tumor invasion of cavernous sinus uh, always required for me gamma knife. I mean, I agree and I promote the opening of the cavernous sinus in patients with acromegaly on Cushing disease because you have to take off all cells possible. But when a tumor, a functional tumor, invades the cavernous sinus in a state like NOSP4, you can cure that patient. That's, that is the one, a reality. But you need to take off all tumor as possible and then treat that patient with gamma knife. All, 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 another patient that is important to to, to irradiate is the ACTH positive in immunohistochemistry because has, has a high regrowth rate that others that not have ACTH positive in immunohistochemistry. The surgery is always the first line treatment. 
And in some cases, in some cases, can be can use that primary treatment. Uh, of course, there is a limitation by size and by location. For example, the compression of the optic nerve contraindicates a treatment in one session and maybe it should be performed in a fractional way. That is in research right now. There is some papers that it's coming with the fractional wave in gram and I, but still, still in, in research for me. And the dose of hormone, uh, the dose for hormones producing tumors I, I, are higher, of course. Our radiosurgical technique, well, we use the angle of, uh, I mean, we use an angle of the, the inclined frame parallel to the axis of the optic apparatus, like um, of the lateral edge of the upper part of the ear. Hmm? Or you can tilt your head to 72 degrees so that the rake's input are parallel to the axis of the optic apparatus. Uh, we limit the dose uh, to eight to 12 grays to 1% of the volume of the optic apparatus. As I will say later, eight grays are a dogma that is changes with, with it will change it, is, it is changed with the time. Now we can accept a 12 grays to 1% of the volume of the optic apparatus with better results. Uh, the internal, uh, International Radiosurgery Association uh, has a guidelines for pituitary tumors of all, it's, it's a little bit ancient for two, 2004, but that study makes a four years show control from 83 to 100% with normalization of hormone secretions in acromegaly to 29 to 82% in Cushing from 63 to 98% and in prolactinomas to 25 to 29%. The problem is that is for that, that the surgery is so important that the latency to reach a normal secretion, a, a normalization of hormonal secretion can, can be has two years or more than two years in acromegaly, one year or more for cushion and even two years for prolactinoma. So we have to mix treatments with the endocrinologist uh, after you after you uh, deliver the gamma knife uh, continue the patient with the medication until the the latency is passed another uh, another objective is the preservation of pituitary function of course and the visual preservation the planning of the gamma knife has to be with high conformality as to the optic nerve, uh, the dose received by the optic nerve had not to be more than eight acids. As I said, it's a dogma and this is not the truth right now. We can, we can, uh, we can reach uh, more high doses. The dose received by the pituitary have to be no more than 15 grays the marginal dose in a non-functional tumor, not less than 16 gray, and the marginal dose in a functioning tumor, not less than 25 grays, and have to be a distance, it's better to be a distance between the optic apparatus and the tumor to achieve a, a better treatment and effective. But now with the new research about fractionation, that can, can change a little bit. This is an example of uh, acromegaly. Uh, this is our beginning. Have you see it has a NOS4 invasion. This is NOS4 invasion. Tell you that you can cure them. You can cure this patient, but you can control that patient. This patient, sorry. Uh, have you see has always we see in acromegaly is a is a, is a five years tumor, consistent tumor. I have to cut it with a knife. Mm -hmm. And um, we will take off all, all the tumor as we can with different instruments. We, we use the curates, we use the sucker, we, we, we use the, uh, another curates more aggressive. Look at it's a firm tumor. Uh, 
but you can see how the endoscopy can can you, you can you can dominate and control all aspects of the surgery uh, with the endoscope. Well, as you see, here we have a tumor in the cavernous sinus that we, in the beginning, we have with the dogma that the eight grays was the most, uh, those that we can use. So for that, we give the patient 20 grays, a 50% of isodose. Uh, excuse me. And okay. And have you seen through the years, this tumor shrinks, hmm, shrinks. It is, it, 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 it is there, it's still there, but it's totally inactive because this patient has almost 10 years of operate with a hormone less than two. Uh, so we continue to give her our follow-up and she's fine. Okay, this is another patient with an acromegaly with a 160 uh, of uh, growth hormone, a, a bitemporal amyanopsia, an invasion NOSC4 here in the cavernous sinus. So we will work over all this tumor. And as you see, we take off the capsule, we take off the capsule and we spare the gland, of course. Have to pay attention because if you are so aggressive with the capsule and you, you don't identify the gland, you take off the gland also. That is not a good, a good thing. Here the gland and It's okay. And this is the result. We will take off all the tumor, but we spare this tumor lateral to the carotid artery. Not even middle to the carotid artery, lateral to the carotid artery. So we give, it's, it's very long, it's very, it's very far away from the optic pathway. So we give 30 grays, sometimes we do that, 30 grays at 50%. And now we have, as you see, this part of the tumor that we had now in this, these days are disappear and we have a hormone less than one. So this patient, I don't know if, it, if it's cured, but it's very, very well controlled. This is another patient. He has a prolactinoma with 5,040 uh, of prolactin and a huge uh, invasive tumor. As you see at the right, my right, you have a tumor that can't reach. By endoscopy, another colleague take off that tumor. And then I, I came from below and take off this tumor. And this is the result. It was, it was very controlled and, and taking medication. But one year after, we have this regrowth. This regrowth, uh, we decide to give him gamma knife, and this tumor, one year after, disappeared completely. And the patient has now 40, 48 uh, of prolactin. He do, he's doing very well. So my conclusions are that the pituitaries uh, are a multidisciplinary team, of course. The surgery is always the, this is the treatment of choice, but there is a role for craniotomy, preferably in minimal invasive conditions, around 30% to 50 in some uh, reviews of patients will need some adjuvant treatment in, in, in the long of his life. Gamma knife is to recommend for recurrences of remains and it has adjuvant treatment because it is safe and highly effective. Achieve control of drug of tumor growth, hormonal normalization, limits radiation exposure for adjacent structures and may play a primary treatment 
in a selected cases that cannot go to surgery. The redefinition of doses, protection, and improvement in neuroimaging allow better results. And there's still a lot of role in definition of fractional radiosurgery in selected cases in the future. I want to thank you very much uh, the, uh, the invitation uh, to this webinar for me has been an honor and a privilege to participate. Thank you very much. And you are all welcome to this land, Dominican Republic, in the middle of the Caribbean Sea, when you can uh, benefit of all these uh, uh, beaches uh, and all our all our uh, Japanese colleagues that likes very much the golf. You have here the better golf courses of the world. So you are welcome to my country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Giancarlo Hernandez. Surely I wanna to go to your country to enjoy a beautiful uh, scenery and enjoy good cuisine. And uh, you showed us the uh, utility of the uh, multi-modality treatment of the tu pituitary tumors, and also showed us the uh, basic techniques of the endoscopic endonasal approach. And I have one question from the audience. So I'm going to tell you. So uh, how do you judge or decide that tumor completely excised? I mean, any image you do intraoperatively or intraoperation, especially in the recurrent cases. And do you have any comment or? No, can, can you repeat to that? Can you repeat uh, the, the- Please open the uh, Q&A. Please open the Q&A. The question is, how do you judge the completeness of the tumor excision intraoperatively? Ah. Especially well, in the recurrent cases. Okay, if I have if I have if I have intraoperative image, uh, no, we don't. As, as a developing country, we have to. As, as a developing country, we have to um, use the the resources have, as as we can. Uh, I do. Uh, I operate the patient. I do a CT scan the the next uh, the next day of the of the patient, and I know. Uh, more or less, how if I if if I if I left tumor behind or not, if I have a tot gross total resection, and then I perform an MRI two months after the after the 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 surgery. We don't have a, in my country yet intraoperative image to assess immediately the result. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Any very comments? Yes. Or, uh, I questions? would like to ask, Professor, yes, yes. Uh, like, right. how do you decide intraoperatively that, yes, I have resected at least 95% of the tumor? Okay. Okay. Yes. Well, you have to, you have to check. I check a first, uh, as, a, as I have a, a routine, I always do the same thing. I check the same thing afterwards. I check, I, I, I use a, a, a huge cotton or sometimes a, a, a ISO and I push, I push the, um, the diaphragma cellar that comes to, to the field. And I check because when you left tumor behind is always in the in the junction of this uh, diaphragma with the cavernous sinus uh, and the uh, dorsum cella and the anterior part so i i check there and i use the endoscope of 30 degrees to do that i check before the dorsum cella then I check both um, cavernous sinus, then I check uh, in front, and then I put um, um, a cotton and I check the junction of the 
diaphragma cella that's come down uh, there in this in that in that uh, in that round corner you can left tumor behind because the diaphragma cella can uh, keep your the side so i do that and i pass always around 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 with another um curate that is is a is a is a ankle curate but it's not so big it's, it's a little one with carefully we 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 um erase if you want that that coin and then uh well have i i don't have any any um intraoperative image for do that but uh, I think that the checking is, is very useful also. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Dr. Liu Bun Seng, we hope your internet is good by now. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Raja. Thank you, Professor, for a very nice uh, presentation. I have a few questions, Professor. Uh, first question is, uh, in transphenoidal approach, do you think the intercarotid distance uh, of 1.5 centimeter is still applicable with the current uh, endoscope. Uh, my second question, Professor, uh, for transcranial approach, uh, there are some techniques uh, opening up optic canal uh, to displace the optic apparatus for better distance uh, uh, to use a gamma knife. Is that a safe practice? Uh, and then uh, my last question, Professor, for cellular lesion, do, do you always need uh, tissue diagnosis before use gamma knife. Thank you, Professor. Yes, uh, well, the, the last one, yes, we have always tissue before gamma knife. We have always, we have a uh, diagnosis with immunotic chemistry. For the, sec for the first uh, question, yes, I agree with you. Uh, when you have, uh, I mean, when you have a, um, a meningioma, for example, hmm? when you have a meningioma, for example, uh, with the experience in my hands, I do little ones, okay? Little ones. When you have a invasion of the optic canal, so, or, or the middle part of the optic canal in one side or another, I use the craniotomy. It can be in minimal invasive fashion because that supraorbital approach is very versatile and you can do a huge tumor. Mm? But we, we, if I have um, invasion of the optic canal, I use the craniotomy. When I have a meningioma, a little b, a, a little one, I can use the endoscopic approach. You can open by, by, uh, by endoscopic approach the 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 canal very easily but i feel more comfortable more comfortable with the craniotomy with when the meningioma or you have a adenoma that is big enough to go to the front, frontal fossa I, I feel more comfortable doing a craniotomy so uh, i use the endoscope as a tool i'm not an endoscopic surgeon i'm a neurosurgeon I use as a tool when I, I know that I can benefit the patient with that, but I don't use the endoscope in every case, uh, whatever case. I mean, I analyze very well the case. As I said, if I have a meningioma with invasion of the optic canal, I use craniotomy in, in whatever fashion. If, you, if it's very huge and it's in the frontal and middle fossa or sphenor spheno orbital where we use a big craniotomy. If you have very in the middle, you can use a supraorbital approach. Thank you, Professor. Thanks for the question. Okay, I have two questions for you. Okay, Professor? Of course. Ram, uh, for the, for the acromega patient, do you perform a pre-operative medical loading test, like a, a using a, a octetotide or bromocryptine? Because if we know the utility, effectiveness of the medication, we don't necessarily need to chase the tumor, especially in, in the uh, lateral side of the cavernous sinus. Do you perform such kind of the uh, 
loading test? Well, that is a good, that's a good question. The problem is that here, in, I mean, in, here in this, in this uh, a, a Asian Congress, we have uh, uh, countries, uh, you have uh, a lot of countries and those countries have the budget for the public health. Sometimes, I mean that, I think that in Japan is a huge and so, some countries is not so big, the, the budget. My country is a developing country. So the octreotide is limit uh, for patient that has first diagnosis, diagnostic of acromegaly in biopsy. Mm? And uh, not all patients can reach the medication easily. So I, pref I, I, I agree with you, with you, you with your question, but I need to operate those patients and, and take off all tumor as possible to have one, diagnosis, and two, if they have problems to, to reach the medication easily, I operate them and I improve them between they reach the medication. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question that is, 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 is not scientific. It's a question that you adapt your practice uh, around your, your um, idiosyncratic uh, things of your countries. I see. That's a problem of developing countries. Sure, you sure. Know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I, I, I agree. I understand. With, uh, maybe you can, you can try. Uh, we have a lot of medication for prolactinomas here that is easily to, 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 to take. And the prolactinomas, the, in prolactinomas, the medication is the first line of treatment, of course. And we see that you take, you have a huge prolactinoma and you take the medication and the prolactinoma shrink, uh, the, the patient improve. Uh, with with um, acromegaly, uh, there is no no always the same the same result as a prolactinoma with the bromocriptine or carbergoline. Uh, but I know your concern and is 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 true. If we can if we have if we can do the that that, that you say it was good for the patient. Thank you. And the I, other I, question. I also yes. Uh, in Japan, for the huge pituitary tumors, we sometimes perform the uh, combined surgery. I mean, uh, using the cranial, cranial, cranial approach and also using the uh, uh, endonasal approach at the same time. Do you perform such kind of operation in your country? I will glad to do that in the future. We can do because of the same thing. We, we need resources to do that. Uh, so we do one first and the other later in the, uh, yeah. in the other time. But that is very interesting. I would like okay. to do it, but for, for this time, I can't yet. Okay. But we will, we will. Okay, any question or comment? from the OM audience. So far it's nil. Yes, Dr. New Jerling Vargas, any comments from your side? No comments, he said. He is my boss, what can I say? It was perfect <laughs> lecture. <laughs> it was oh, it's, it's, a, it's a Japanese style, you, it's a Japanese you're style. Gonna put, you gotta put me in trouble. <laughs> no, I have my two bosses today in the conference. So I, yeah, yeah, sure. I, I cannot say nothing. <laughs> Just okay. thank you for okay. the lecture. Right. Thank okay. you very much. Perfect. Okay. We, we can wind this up and hear the concluding remarks from Professor Kenichi Oyama. Yes, I want to close this uh, lecture. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, lecturers, uh, Professor Murayama and the Professor uh, Giancarlo. And also, I'd like to say thank you to the uh, old audience and, and Raja. Thank you very much.
thank you thank you very much professor murayama is still with us it's very kind of him to sit back so late thank you very much murayama sensei so that i would like to close this officially on behalf of the education committee of the acns and the president professor yoko kaito i would like to sincerely thank both the speakers of today professor yuchi murayama and professor giancarlo hernandez and the chair professor kenichi yama for the time and support for the educational activities of the acns a special thanks to professor shubin for supporting us in our educational ventures and also broadcasting these webinars in china today there are around 840 viewers who have joined us live on youtube wechat and zoom a special thanks to my co-host dr liu bun singh for joining in today so until we all meet on saturday it is bye bye from all of us thank you very much for joining